All right, good morning, church. We're glad you're here today to worship with us. Let's stand together as we sing that there is nothing better than Jesus. Amen. Come on, sing it out. I've searched the world. today.
Amen. There is nothing better than Jesus. Not one single thing, not one person, nothing is better than Jesus Christ. I've been studying a little bit in Genesis, New Year, starting over, and I just read a passage last week, and this worship set was already planned and everything, but I just thought it was so cool, the timing of how God does things. He just reveals things to you, the Spirit does, in such a cool way. And I was reading about how Joseph encounters his brothers in Egypt, and he says, what you meant for evil, God has used for good. And I think about that when we sing this song. You know, Romans 8 says that he takes all things and works them together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And all the things that the enemy would scream at you and say, this is a failure, this is a bad thing, you did wrong here, this is, you're never going to get past this, this is a, a, a grave for you in your life. And God says, let me take that and let me work it for my glory and turn it into something good. So something might seem incredibly difficult right now. Something might seem that way. And I understand. I've been there. We all have. But I'm telling you, God can take wherever you are and whatever you're walking through, even the heaviest of heavy things, and he can work it together for your good and for his glory such a good and amazing thing. So today, I want to encourage you. We just sang a song that says, there's nothing better than you. Well, you might be in a situation where you feel like, well, I can think of a whole lot of things that would be awesome right now. Because uh, this is kind of tough, this spot in my life, what I'm walking through in this moment. But there's nothing better. Not one single thing. Not one outcome. Nothing's better than Jesus. And we're about to sing another song that says, how could I ever thank you? You've been so good to me. And I just want to encourage you today, whether you're in a season of life where you feel like, man, I believe that. I am on the mountaintop. Nothing's better. God is so good. Sing that at the top of your lungs. And if you're in the valley today and life is difficult and it's heavy, still sing it at the top of your lungs because it's still true and God will bless it. Let's do it out of obedience today because God loves you and he wants to take what you have and work it together. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that that's the God that we serve? Amen. Come on, let's sing this together. You have my yes. You can have my cares. You can have this world's distraction. You can have my eyes. You can have
worthy. Amen. Come on, this is all of us right here. All the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Come on, tell him this morning, no matter where you're at. And all
He's that, amen? He's great. You know, that second song we had the opportunity to sing together, I love that thought of, you have my yes. The goodness and the greatness of our God leads us to a place of that surrender, of no matter where we are, no matter what's going on, we're saying yes to him and being obedient to what he's calling us to do. And so can we pray that thought and prayer together this morning? And as we pray, we want to pray for a disaster relief team as well that have put their yes on the table, that are serving right now in Selma, Alabama, and doing different things there to just to help with all that's happened in the last week or so. And so we want to pray for them, but we also want to be a people of prayer and asking God to help us to say yes to him and whatever he's calling us to. So let's pray this morning. Father, we do come first and foremost just proclaiming your greatness and your goodness. God, we understand today, I hope and pray that every breath, everything that we have is yours and because of you. And so, Father, we just praise you for that and we thank you for that. This morning, though, as well, we do pray specifically for this team from Ridgecrest that are serving right now in in Selma and the way that they are being used by you, that you would continue to give them strength and wisdom as they finish up today and come home to just be obedient at what's right in front of them and help remove debris and help uh, get people's lives kind of back together in different ways, but also give them strength to be obedient and just uh, continuing to shine their light and share the gospel as you give them that opportunity. Father, though, then we pray that for all of us today, God, that we wouldn't just sing those lyrics that we worshiped together with earlier, but God, it would be the cry of our heart that to allowing you to have our yes, that we are willing to do whatever, however, whenever that you want us to do for your glory. And may we be a people that desires obedience above all things. And so, God, I pray that for us in this room this morning. God, we ask now that you would speak to us today, that you would anoint the words of our pastor and use him greatly today as we continue to walk through this series and think about this new year. God, use his words clearly today. May they be from you, and then God, strengthen us to just be obedient to that as you lead us in the days ahead. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our church. God, the blessing of being together, may we never take that for granted as well. It's in the great and mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Welcome to Ridgecrest. We're so glad that you're here today. We're so excited for what the Lord is doing in our church and excited that you are a part of that today. If you're a guest of ours, we want to say a special welcome to you. Thank you for visiting with us today, and we look forward to getting to know you in the days ahead and let you know more about our church. And one step to move forward in that direction is filling out what we call our Next Steps card. If you're a guest of ours today, you can look on the back of your worship folder and you see a Next Steps card there that you can tear out. You can fill out that information and you can drop in the offering baskets as you leave. But we would rather you come to our Welcome Center, which is out the back doors here to the right, side door here to the left. Come by the Welcome Center after the service today. Bring that card with you. Meet us there. We have a gift bag for you. And we look forward to helping you know more about our church. You also can look in front of you there on your seat racks, or if you're worshiping online, you'll see a QR code there on your screen right now. You can scan that QR code that's on the seat rack in front of you or right there on your screen online, and that'll take you to an online form. And as you fill out that online form, you can let us know different areas that you're interested in in our church and different things that are going on here that you can be a part of. And we receive that from you once you submit it, and we'll follow up with you this week with more information. So two ways right there that you can take next steps with us here at Ridgecrest, and we'd love for you to do that today. One other thing before we check out RBC3, we are partnering with Wiregrass Hope Group here in Dothan, and we are doing what's called the Baby Bottle Boomerang. Say that three times fast to the person sitting next to you. Some of you tried. All right, so Baby Bottle Boomerang. It's an opportunity to support Wiregrass Hope Group, and Brother Chuck passed on some information to me earlier. Listen to this, 78... 78 children were born this past year because of the work at Wiregrass Hope Group where their moms were thinking about abortion. And so 70, yeah, that's amazing news. There are 78 little ones that have an opportunity to fulfill the purpose that God has for them because of what Wiregrass Hope Group is doing uh, in our city and in this community. 
And so the baby bottle boomerang, you can pick up a baby bottle. If there's not some left at the end of the service, we'll have some more. Call the church office. We can get those to you. But it's a way for you to put change, dollar bills, write a check, just a way for us to support what the Lord is doing through that ministry in our community. So we'd love for you to pick up one of those, again, in the Welcome Center on your way out. And if they're gone, call the church office. We'll get you one uh, this week. Uh, I'd love for you to partner with us in that area of ministry. We're going to check out now RBC3 on some other things that are happening in our church. So turn your attention now to the screen. Ridgecrest, I'm Susan Anderson. I have three minutes to let you know what is happening here and how you can get connected. This is RBC3. We're excited to begin our second semester right here at Ridgecrest Christian Academy. Our kindergarten, first, and second graders are learning biblical truth and a biblical worldview in all things, and we can't wait to see what God is going to do in the lives of these children. We will add a third grade to RCA for the upcoming school year, and registration is already underway for all grades. To learn more about Ridgecrest Christian Academy, visit our website at rbcdothan.org slash academy. Our preteen and student ministry is always busy, but we have a lot planned this summer and the deadline to lock in on a spot for summer camps is coming up. Our preteen summer camp is July 18th through the 21st in Shaco Springs, and our Generate summer camp for 7th through 12th graders is July 6th through 10th at Southern Wesleyan University in South Carolina. A non-refundable deposit of $60 for these camps is due today. Please see Auburn Shepherd or Chase Falk for more information or come by the Welcome Center. And also don't forget Wired Week coming up June 25th through the 29th. This is for any student who has completed 7th grade by June of this year, so register today. Also, if you're connected to the preschool ministry here at Ridgecrest, RSVP now for the Valentine's Brunch set for Saturday, February 11th at 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Make your reservation no later than Sunday, February 5th by contacting Sarah Joy Price at sprice at rbcdothan.org. So Ridgecrest, thank you for supporting our Ridgecrest Christian Academy and visit our website if you would like to know more. Put your deposit in no later than today for preteen and student summer camps and begin planning now for Wired Week at the end of June. And RSVP to Sarah Joy Price for our preschool Valentine's brunch on February 11th at 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Now you're all caught up. I'm Susan Anderson, and you've been watching RBC3. If you will, take your Bibles and open up to Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Glad you're here today. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. We're in the series, kind of a break from our previous series, in a new series called All Things New in a New Year. And so far in 2023, we've talked about singing a new song, a spiritual song, and maybe you've lost your song. And God wants to renew that in the new year. And then we talked last week about things like your attitude and your mind and, and uh, how the world assaults that and how Jesus can renew our minds. And today I want to talk about how to be the right kind of steward in the coming year. One Christian leader put it this way, he said, the stewardship of our resources is a serious business and God's will is that we give it serious attention. This demands that we have the right perspective on our resources 
And that is only possible if we have the right focus on our source of all our resources. Well, that's a really important truth to incorporate in our life, to live by. Especially right now, you know, as you start hearing more and more out there that's telling us things like um, a recession, is, we're headed into a recession. Some even say we're already in a uh, recession. Um, but I want to encourage you this morning with s- some facts. Did you know the fact is that in God's uh, kingdom, there has never been a recession? Never. And did you know in God's economic plan, there never will be a recession? That's why if you want to get in on that, you've got to understand what he has to say about what he has entrusted to us. Now, let me tell you that stewardship is not tipping God, you know, like we sometimes do. We just give a, a waiter or a waiter. And by the way, at Ridgecrest, when you go out to eat someplace, always tip generously. Do you know waiters, I've asked them, waiters and waitresses tell me, the day they, they uh, hate working the most is on Sundays. And I figure, well, that's because it's a weekend. That's not why. Do you know why? Because that's when the church people come to eat. And they have told me this, that church people are the uh, most demanding and leave the least amount of tip. So by the way, let, let, that not be, let, let that not be us. Well, that's not even the point. But sometimes we do that with God, don't we? We kind of we kind of just give him a little tip there and say, hey, thanks God. But our response to God as stewards, of course, stewardship involves more than just the financial side of us, but our response to God is to say, God, what can I give you? How can I show how much I I am grateful for what you did? You paid a debt uh, on the cross for me that I could have never paid uh, in my entire life. And so I think what we have to understand is what Jesus said about stewardship. To whom much is given, much is required. Do you know by the world standard, most of us are extremely wealthy. You say, well, I don't feel wealthy, but by the world standards, most of us are extremely wealthy. And that's why uh, stewardship is so important for us in the kingdom of God, because uh, the question isn't, uh, by the way, what, how much you have. It's what you do with what you have. Are you obedient to God with that? Listen to a shocking recent study. This study is from this past year, 2022, and it relates not to people that don't know God. It relates to people who are evangelical Christians. They did a study. About 11% of evangelical Christians never attend a church and never give any money uh, 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 of those who don't. Uh, attend. More than a quarter of American evangelical uh, Christians don't give anything to the church at all. And according to the survey, another 15% who do attend church uh, never put any money uh, in the baskets or in any giving process. And of course, historically, the survey said uh, uh, giving increases with income and with our age. But the study also concluded that millennials, and there are a lot of millennials watching us today and a part of this, and, and Gen Z, are more, much more likely, rather than give to God, to give uh, to family and friends and even strangers, rather than support the work of the church of God. Listen to these percentages uh, of evangelical Christians who give to the church. 10% of evangelical Christians give more than 8%. You get that? 10% give more than 8%. 23% of evangelical Christians give 2 to 8%. 2% to 8%. 26% of evangelical Christians give 0. 42% of evangelical Christians give less than 2%. Now, I want to tell you something. As a pastor, that's pretty depressing. But the fact is, it reveals a deep gap between what we often confess we believe and what we practice. And so this morning, uh, I want us to examine what Jesus says related to stewardship. The Bible speaks a lot about stewardship. I mean, it speaks a ton about stewardship. Do you know it is said that the two subjects, the Bible and Jesus and the gospel speak the most about, are stewardship and the second coming of Christ. And so if you're physically able to do so, why don't you stand with me this morning as we honor the reading of God's Word. We're just going to read two verses, then I want to come back and give you a little bit of background from the the segment of Scripture that we are reading from. Verse 37 of Luke chapter 6, 
Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Then look at verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Let's pray. Father, would you take this morning and would you speak your truth into our heart? Would you convict us and would you uh, challenge and change us, Father, with it? We pray, Father, we'll get it. We'll get what you want us to get. You know what we need to hear. And so, Father, may I faithfully deliver your word. Father, let it be your word, not my word. Speak through me, I pray, to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, some of you, have you ever heard, how many of you have ever heard the expression Sermon on the Mount? You ever heard that? You know, that's Matthew's gospel, chapters 5, 6, and 7 particularly focus. And the Sermon on the Mount is a wonderful segment of Scripture because what it does is Jesus is just really giving some life principles. You know, if you want to do life right, and we're talking about doing life right in the new year, and this is one of those things you got to get right, it's stewardship. And so Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount gives all these life principles. Well, if you look at Luke 6, you see the same thing, that Jesus is giving a lot of life principles. And that's why you can break this text up into a variety of of segments, because it's like Jesus said, okay, so let me give you a couple of principles. Okay, let me give you another couple of principles. Okay, here are another couple of principles. And what he's saying is, let me just give you some basic uh, ideas. Well, not ideas. Let me give you some basic truths for living the way God designs you to live. And so what we're doing, we're really focusing on one verse in this passage. Now, it's interesting, I mentioned the Sermon on the Mount, but this looks a lot like it. Some scholars say these verses 17 through 49 are are, are really the Sermon on the Mount. But the fact is, um, there's something, uh, verse 17 may change that. Look at verse 17. It says, and he, that's Jesus, came down with them and stood on a level place with a great uh, crowd of his disciples, a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. This says Jesus came down to the plain. So that's why scholars say, most scholars say, this isn't the exact same uh, uh, setting as the Sermon on the Mount. So you have the Sermon on the Mount. Someone has called this the Sermon on the Plain. But in both cases, we get these principles, these principles for, for living. And verse 38 is one of the principles in particular that relates to our stewardship. And Jesus is not ambiguous, but he's very clear on how giving works in the kingdom of God. And frankly, as I said, the whole Bible is pretty clear on that. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's pretty clear about all these things. So we're entering this new year. 2023 is an opportunity for you and for me to get stewardship and giving right. Uh, in order for us to reap the harvest of obedience that Jesus describes in the passage this morning. Now, I've titled this message, A New Kind of Stewardship, because it goes with our series, you know, All Things New in the New Year, A New Kind of Stewardship. You may be here, and if you've been under our ministry here for years, you know I've preached stewardship uh, dozens and dozens of times. In fact, every year about this time, uh, I... uh, I, I preach about, uh, about stewardship, in particular about giving. We're headed toward a thing I'll mention in a minute called Prove the Tithe Sunday on the 5th. But I do this every year. Now, if you, if you, and I don't know what you give, by the way. I don't know what any of you give unless you walk up and say, Hey, Pastor, i got this money here I want to do something with. Would you take it and uh, put it towards something uh, that we need to do? That's about the only time I know what you give because I don't go through your file and I don't look and say, Hmm... And I've made that a rule in my own life and ministry because, frankly, I don't want to get depressed out of my head. And uh, secondly, because I don't want to ever minister to anybody in my flock based on what they give. So if I don't know, I can just minister to you and think you're one of the greatest givers in the church. And I want it that way, and I like it that way. But, but you say, so, Pastor, you've preached this a lot, and I have, and... and uh, uh, over the years, but every year I'm going to preach again. If you were perfect givers, if our congregation and those who are live stream family and all, if you were perfect givers and 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 I knew you were perfect givers, do you know something? I would preach this every year anyway. Do you know why? Because it's in God's Word, and to avoid it means I'd only preach the stuff that's easy to preach versus the stuff that's 
that people don't always enjoy hearing about. But it actually is for your good. And, I, well, I, look, I'm not a theoretician about this. I'm a practitioner. I've been doing what I'm talking to you about today since I was a teenager, since I learned it. And it works. I'm a satisfied customer. And every year, some people will get it. They'll get it. I had some people come up to me after the first service and said, I discovered something today about giving that I never re recognized before. I had some comical stuff uh, from people, uh, too. I have to tell you, this morning, uh, I was praying early when I, I got up because I, I, it was raining. And I was praying early, and I could hear the rain. I said, not today, Lord. And I said, Lord, make it go away. And by the way, the Lord kind of pushed it away until we could all get here and I think it started back up a little bit, which means I'm going to just keep you until it quits raining. <laughs> no. But I'm praying this morning, I'm thinking, God, the two worst things for a preacher, rain and a sermon on giving. <laughs> and, uh, but no, really, at this stage, four decades of ministry, I, that stuff doesn't bug me anymore. I got past that a long time ago. But listen to this, God wanted you here today. And so God's got something for you, so don't, don't miss that. But, um, uh, but there are a lot of folks who believe what we're going to talk about, they just don't practice it. And so I've, I've titled this, A New Kind of Stewardship. You say, but you've preached this. Yes, I have. And many of you have gotten it, and new folks every year get it, and they, they get on, and, uh, uh, on board with what God says about the, that whole process. But uh, it's new. And you say, but it's not new. If you understand tithing and giving and giving beyond, it's not new to you. But do you know when Jesus spoke these words, this was a completely new concept. This was altogether new. It was radical when Jesus said, give and, and then God will give back. Because uh, oh, heretofore, they lived by the law. And so they did what they were required to do. You know, okay, we got to tithe. We've got to tithe. And by the way, the Old Testament tithe was probably more like 30% than 10% because they had to give out of a bunch of different categories. That's another uh, time, another message. But so, so heretofore, they had lived by the law, and so everything was begrudgingly. But now what Jesus is trying to teach them is a new, th a new thing. He didn't nullify the law. You say, well, I'm not. I've had people tell me this. Well, I'm not under the law anymore. I'm under grace. Yes, we are under grace. Thank God for that. Amen? Aren't you glad you're under grace? We're under grace. But let me ask you something. So people say, so I don't have to give like the law says. The law says a minimum of 10%. So, but I'm under grace. I'm not under law. Therefore, I don't have to give. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think you would give Jesus less under grace than you would by the law? Wouldn't grace cause you to say he deserves so much more than the law demands? In fact, Jesus taught a principle about, uh, from the Roman law. not the, 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 He taught this principle. He said, if a Roman soldier comes to you and says, I'm tired of carrying my pack. I've been carrying it, and by law, I can conscript somebody to, to help me. And so he walks up, Wally, and he says to you, he says, uh, Wally, I'm tired of carrying my pack. I need you to carry my pack a mile for me. Because the law, and then Wally would have to carry, because I'm a Roman soldier. I'm tired of carrying my pack for a while. I need a break. And Ro Wally's a, a good citizen. And so I said, Wally, I need you to carry that the next mile for me. And the law said that I could do that, and he would have to do that. Don't you? I bet Wally would really think highly of me. Come on, Wally, pick it up. Right? Jesus said that's what the law required, right? Have y'all read that story in the Gospels? But Jesus added to it. You know what Jesus said? If he requires you to carry it a mile, carry it two miles. Go beyond the law. Now listen to me. So when somebody says to you, well, I'm under grace, I'm not under the law. Jesus also said, I didn't come to nullify the law, I came to fulfill the law. So if somebody uses that with you about giving, say, well, wouldn't grace, by, wouldn't grace, wouldn't the principle of grace, if you want to use that as the rule, cause you to do more than less? Are y'all with me? Doesn't that make, does that make sense? See, and so uh, there, there are folks, uh, uh, here. so what Jesus was saying was radical. He's saying go beyond. And if you give, then you're going to, uh, well, well, 
let me show you two major things, all right, and a couple things underneath. First of all, I want you to see that Jesus speaks of the generosity of stewardship. Jesus is talking about being very generous. Give, and it will be given to you. Uh, Jesus is talking about giving from what we have received. Obviously, you, God only holds you accountable for what you have, not for what you don't have. People say, well, I can't give very much. The question is, are you doing with what you have what God expects you to do with what you have, not what you don't have? The believer is not, to, uh, I mean, the believer is to give and, and to live out of this kind of uh, spirit of giving, and not a spirit of selfishness and hoarding. Uh, most of you guys know who Denzel Washington is. Y'all know who Denzel Washington is. Great actor. By the way, uh, has confessed his faith in Christ. And uh, I came across a, a short video of Denzel Washington, and he is um, offering some spontaneous career advice to a, a group of young actors and actresses. Um, and it's an un- informal setting. His remarks are uh, kind of off the cuff, and they're unrefined. But his views align with some key themes of Christian stewardship. Listen to what he says. And this is a quote. This is Denzel, what he said. He said, I pray that you all put your shoes way under the bed at night so that you got to get on your knees in the morning when you wake up to find them. And he says, and while you're down there on your knees, thank God for grace and mercy and understanding. He said, we all fall short of the glory of God, but if you just start thinking about all the things you got to say thank you for, well, that's a full day. That's easily a day. You never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. Now, he says, I've been blessed to make hundreds of millions of dollars in my life, but I can't take it with me, and neither can you. It's not how much you have, but it is what you do with what you have. Isn't that pretty good? It's pretty good. That's really our responsibility. Biblically, that's what the Bible uh, uh, talks about. And there are two things in this whole matter of, of the generosity of stewardship I want you to see. First of all, I want you to note the practice of giving, the practice of giving. And it's simply stated, Jesus says, give. He says, give. I mean, it's not complicated. That's pretty simply stated, pretty matter-of-factly. It's like, it's like Nike's old commercial, just do it. And by the way, I love it because, you know, I've taught you something. This is an imperative. Let's see if you've learned anything over the years. What is an imperative? Somebody tell me what an imperative is. It's a command. That's a command. Jesus says, give. Just do it. It is a command. That is the practice of giving. Now, how do you become good at something? How do you become good at something, class? You know how you become good at something. You do it. You practice it. You, it becomes a part of your kind of spiritual DNA. And uh, you just have to do what Jesus says. That's what he, he, he's saying here. If, if you've never really done this now, it might be difficult for you. I, I know there, there are folks that say, I've, I've never done that. And I don't know if I, 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 I that kind of spooks me. Every, every time I talk about this through the years, people say, well, that's kind of spooky. We've never done that. And I don't see how, I don't see how we can, can do it. I told you that I am a practitioner, not a theoretician. I'm a satisfied company. I want to tell you, I've been doing this since I was 14 years old. And my wife and I have been doing it since we were married. And I have to tell you something. There were times and have been times, and I assume will be times in the future, well, I don't know how it's all going to work out. I can tell you, I'm not, I, look, I got so many stories. I got a refrigerator story. I got a mail card. I, I pulled, pushed a mail card. I mean, I got all these stories of how God did exactly what he promised to do if I would be obedient in my giving to him. And, uh, and, and I, I, I mean, I, I've had those times, Alice and I, we can remember where on paper it just didn't work. And I didn't know how it was going to work. I didn't shortchange God, though, to make it work. But God, when I was faithful and, uh, and obeyed God, it always worked. And, and I'll be honest, I'm pretty analytical, so I, can, I like to look at things and you know, and say, well, this and this and this and this and this, and that means it. I'm pretty analytical, but I'll be honest with you. There have been many times through the years that, that God just did something that I couldn't explain. And then you have a lot of, by the way, remarkable stories, too, 
of how God came through. There's stories right in this congregation where I've had people telling me when they practiced what God tells them practice. There's some incredible stories uh, that they have told me. And, and so I, I understand it can be spooky. It, it can it can be it can be really spooky. I had a funny story. A man, I, let me tell you. He, I asked him, could I use this if if it was appropriate? I won't call his name from the first service. And uh, God has been very good to this man and, and uh, has blessed him uh, uh, financially uh, through years. But he told me, he says, Pastor, I got to come up. I've got to confess something to you. And he said, um, I got up to I, a couple of days ago. I, I was writing checks, and he said, I wrote my tithe check out. And um, he said, uh, and I got to thinking, he says, and we, we have more than given. We give to the funds and missions and all those kinds of things uh, well over our tithe. And he said, I got to thinking, you know what? I'm give, that's a lot of money. I think I'm going to cut back. And he said, I hate to tell you that, Pastor, but he said, you got to hear the... He said, so I, I, I think I'm going to cut back a little bit. I'm still going to tithe, but I'm going to cut back on, on some of the other side. And, and he says, and, uh, and so he said, I got up to come to church. He said, and you know, he said, do you think the devil works on us that way? I said, I know he does. I said, because I've been there. Look, I, I want to tell you something, and I'm not doing this. Everything I'm telling you, I practice. Allison, I practice. You need to know, you need to know that I do what I'm telling you. Okay? But I want to tell you, we give more. Alice and I give more. I'm not doing that. Look, I'm not trying to, that's not to parade righteousness in front of you. I just want you to know something. You need to at least know. Because by the way, and I probably, I don't know if I should say this. I said it in the first service. I don't know. I may hear about it. But there are preachers out there that don't practice what they're telling their people to practice in this area. And I, I'm not going to get into that, but, but, but they're true. There are some who say just the fact that I am a pastor means I don't have to do that because this is my offering. Uh, see, I don't believe that at all. I believe I'm a pastor. I have to lead by example. Number two, I believe I'm going to be accountable to whom much is given, much is required. I believe I'm going to be accountable too. That's an, that, oh, no, I, I, I didn't mean uh, to get in. Uh, that. Let me get back to the story. Y'all sidetrack me. <laughs> that happens a lot, doesn't it? Um, it's your fault. So, so he says to me, he says, so uh, a pastor, he said, could that be the devil? I said, I know it's the devil because I've battled that too, Allison. I give uh, much more than is required. And so I said, yes, I've had the devil whisper and say, you know, you've been given so much and, and so long and you give more and all of this kind of, of stuff. And why don't you just cut back a little bit? See, y'all got to stay now because I hear it. <laughs> and so so he said, does that, I said, of course it's the devil. It works on everybody. Like, you've battled that too before. And he said, well, I did. He said, I wrote my check and it was for less than what I would normally write it for. And he said, I still met my tithe, but he said, I, I, I do. And he said, but here's a funny thing. He said, <laughs> he said, I got in a hurry, got in the car, headed to church and forgot my check. He said, I had no idea what you'd be preaching on today. He said, so I just want you to know, I'm going to be tearing that check up and putting a run. I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But you, you've been there. But the devil can work on our brains about the, these uh, kinds of things. But, but it can be scary if you've never done it before. And I just want to tell you to take God's word seriously about that. Now, let me just tell, let me give you three observations. This isn't on your outline, but let me give you three observations. Over 40 years of ministry... Let me give you three observations about why people um, don't obey God in their giving. This is, this is a, my personal perspective, 40 years of doing this and watching. And this is, here are three things. Number one, because of a lack of belief in Scripture. A lack of belief. Now you say, well, I believe Scripture. Well, are you doing it? A confession doesn't mean you're obeying. Hello? Hello? And there are a lot of folks who confess, yeah, I believe Scripture, but then they don't practice what Scripture says. 
And so it's been my observation all these years is one of the reasons people don't give obediently is because they really don't believe what God says about this whole thing. Number two, it's been my observation, is because not only do they not believe in Scripture, but they lack trust in God. They fear that God will not provide. But if I do that, I just not... Um, I've used this, what I'm about to tell you. I heard, um, I heard it from another person, and I picked it up, and I used it. I had opportunity. Most preachers would have opportunity to use this. But some years ago, a, um, a guy in my church, like his, I, I guess this has happened many times in many different places, uh, he, I, I had preached on the subject of giving and everything. And he says this to me later. He says, you know, I just, I just can't get there, but he says, I, I just can't get there because he says, I make so much money. Do you realize how much a tithe of my income would be? He said, I used to, but I didn't make this kind of money. But he said, now if I tithe, you realize how much that would be? And I said, yeah, I realize how much that would be. And he said, well, I just can't, you, I, he, he said, I just can't, he says, just, I said, well, let's do something. And I'd pick this up from somebody else. I said, let's pray that God reduces your salary back to a level you feel you can tithe again. <laughs> he said, whoa, no, let's don't do that. He said, I get it. I get it. I said, well, you, I, he said, I said, tithing's obedient and you said you can't. So let's get you back to a salary level where you can. You see, tithing is proportional, right? It's not about how much you make. It's about what you give in proportion to what you make. And God can, look, God can change all that too, by the way. So sometimes it is, we don't really trust God. Well, will God, if I do, will God take care of me? I, as I tell you again, man, I am a living, breathing example that it works even when, when it doesn't it doesn't look like it will work. It works. That's where you just have to, you have to say, I really do trust God. Here, here's a third observation. is my observation. Uh, that people don't give obediently because they are more self-focused in their pursuits than they are in the priorities of the kingdom. And that one's an ouch, isn't it? And a lot of times what that means is, well, I want this for me, and I want to do this for me. And if I don't, if I give that, I might not be able to do this. And, or this. And by the way, I'm not going to promise you that if you give to God, you'll be able to do this or do that. That's not even what it's about. I'll get to that in a minute. You see, it's not, well, okay, so if I'll give to him and so then he'll give back and I can do that and that and that and that and that. That may not happen. But just hang on, okay, I'll get there. Now, coming up in a, a couple of weeks is our Prove the Tithe Day. And by the way, Chuck did a great job of putting, I said, wouldn't it be cool to show our people where some of their giving goes. This is your mission. This is just missions. This past year, almost $470,000. And if we were honest, we could probably go find where we've given other special things uh, to do uh, 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 kingdom work. And uh, I don't even think this includes something, for example, like uh, Thanksgiving meals. You, you, does it? Is that it? It doesn't include this, what we're doing with the Wiregrass group in terms of the baby bottles. But, but at any rate, this shows you kind of, this is just missions. This isn't the other ministries of the church. This is just missions, almost $470,000. Uh, now, and I'm so grateful for Ridgecrest. I have to tell you something. You guys, I tell our staff this, and they would testify this, that we're fortunate because any time over the years I've stood up and said, hey, we've got, here's a need or here's a thing, you guys have given so generously. By the way, the, I mentioned the Thanksgiving meals. Y'all remember the Thanksgiving home, feeding the homeless? You fed over 500 homeless people, uh, 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 full Thanksgiving meals. But listen, you were so generous. We had so much left over that I used it to feed our staff for Christmas. No, I didn't. I didn't. Actually, what I did was, I, I didn't do it. What we did is we took the leftover money. We didn't put it in the budget. You know what we did with it? We gave it to the same love in action. We gave it to them. And you know what they did? They used it to buy groceries 
for families for Christmas. And I don't know, I think hundreds of families receive groceries for Christmas because of your generosity. I'm so grateful that you, so I'm not here to fuss at you this morning, okay? But I, I just want you, look, I want you to get this life principle because I know it works. And I know it will change your life because God has all the resources he has the cattle on a thousand fields. And by the way, it is God, Deuteronomy says, that gives you the ability to make wealth. It's God, 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 God. So you got to do economy God's way. Because if you look out there at the economy and what they're saying about the economy, you'll say, how in the world is it going to work out? When you're having to pay $8 for eggs, you know, how's it going to work out? Get on God's plan and God will work it out. And so on February 5th, we're going to have Prove the Type. You've already received a letter from me with an envelope in it. You can use the envelope. You can give it some other way. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And this isn't an extra, this is not an extra offering. All I'm doing, and we've done this for 10 years, is say, try, to, try tithing. On that Sunday, everybody, everybody bring your, your tithe. on. That. If you can work it out where you can tithe on that Sunday, online or whatever, do it. Because I want you to see the power of, of a church that tithes. And by the way, I'll be doing it. Alice and I'll be doing it. I, I put my tithe in today. I put my tithe and more in today. Again, that's not to do this. That's just simply say, I'm not asking you to do something that your pastor and his wife won't do. It. And by the way, you say, well, pastor, you make more than I do. I, it, it has nothing to do with that. I was doing this when I made less than you. I was doing this before I was a pastor. I was doing this before I served on a church staff. It works. I want you to do it. I love, our, I love you. I love our church. And I, I, I want you to enjoy this principle that Jesus talked about frequently. Okay, let me move on. Now, I told you that this was a command. Okay, we get that. But it's also something else in the Greek. It is in what we call the present active tense. You know what that means? Present active means you, you do it now. You keep doing it, and you never stop doing it. This is, a, this is a lifestyle. This is a life principle that you uh, carry on. And many of, our, uh, many of the scriptures are cultivated simply through practice, by doing it. I've got to move on. Number two under uh, generosity is not only the practice of giving, but the principle of giving. Now, watch, be, listen to me carefully, because your tendency might be to say, now, wait a minute, isn't the practice of giving the same as the principle of giving? No, the practice is about your act, right? Your act of obedience. You just do it. The principle is stated by Jesus this way. Give, and here's, here's the principle, and it will be given to you. You see it? Give is just the act. It will be given is the principle. If you give, then here's the principle. It will be given to you. Do you get that? Uh, that's it, plain and simple. Now, it's important to understand that we do not give obediently to try to manipulate God so that He will give to us. But this is a sound principle uh, that we can trust. And it's given to us by Jesus. So, in other words, when we respond obediently to the command to give, God has a principle of response and by the way, in even greater measure than you give. And that leads to the second thing that I want you to see this morning. So we see the generosity of stewardship, but there is also the reciprocity of stewardship. Now look on the screen so you know how to spell that. <laughs> I know what it is, I know what it meant, but I had to look up how to spell it to make sure I didn't put it on here wrong. The reciprocity of stewardship. Notice verse 38 says, Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's reciprocity. Reciprocity simply means, the easiest way to understand reciprocity would be what goes around comes back around. Uh, reciprocity is about an exchange, so you exchange and you receive. That's what reciprocity is. In other words, when you give to God, He gives back to you. But in this case, Jesus says God does more than give back in equal measure. God gives abundantly in return. Randy Alcorn, a great uh, uh, Christian writer, says this, the more you give, the more comes back to you because God is the greatest giver in the universe and He will not let you outgive Him. Go ahead, he says, and try it and see what happens. 
And that's consistent with what, what the prophet Malachi wrote in Malachi 3 and, and verses 10 11. Listen to what he says. Listen to this. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse. And by the, so the prophet says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. Do you know what the equivalent of the storehouse would be? It's the church. It was where the work of God uh, emanated from. It was where the work of God went out from. And that's real interesting because there are a lot of people out there who say, well, if I tithe, I'm going to give it to this organization or this organization. No, the tithe first comes to the church. It comes to the storehouse. Listen, it goes on. Uh, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Here's a great line. Don't miss this one. And thereby put me to the test says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the heaven, uh, the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Isn't that an incredible couple of verses? Well, by the way, I didn't read the verses before that in which the prophet said to the people of God, will a man rob God? And they said, how are we robbing you, God? You know what he, his answer was? Before this verse, it says, in, in your tithes and offerings. By not giving obediently, they, God said, you're robbing me. And then he says, so test me in this. I'm just telling you, test me in it. This is the only place in all of Scripture where God says you can test him. Think about that. God, in fact, guess what it is, class? It's a command. God says, test me in this and see if i'll not open up the heavens and pour out a blessing on you some translations uh, translate this way and pour out a blessing beyond your ability to handle i mean that's pretty good stuff uh it's a promise to uh, that we can take advantage of who wouldn't want to get in on that kind of promise right that is reciprocity to the max And by the way, when God says, test me in this, he doesn't say, test the preacher. So don't go out here and say, I'm going to test the preacher. I'm going to put the preacher. That will probably fail. God says, test me. Now, don't go testing him about other things. Well, if I can test you in that, I'm going to test. Ooh, be careful. But this one, he says, test him in. All right? It's reciprocity. Now, I'm just, what I'm, here, look, here's what I'm doing. I want to, in the new year, I want you to get this right. I I want you, I I want to give you a principle that will change your life. This would be true of me if I weren't, uh, if I retired from preaching and retired from pastoring. This would still be true. And I want you to grasp it. And frankly, the statistics tell us most have not. So let me give you a couple of things to expand on this, and then we're done. Uh, Under this, you see the product of giving. Did you notice that? What is the product of giving? It is an abundant return. God is a lavish giver. And and by that, I, I don't mean to suggest to you that the end product of obedient giving is your personal wealth. There are some charlatans out there that have abused the Scripture and tried to say, well, God wants you to be wealthy. So you give or you give to me, or to my, and so God will make you wealthy. I want to tell you something. That's a train wreck. That's charlatanism. And I've heard them, and you've heard them, and all of that sort of stuff. I always want to ask them. I've never had the chance, but I don't ask them this when they say that. I want to say, so what happened to the Apostle Paul? Because he spent most of his ministry in prison, most of the time without... Uh, great wealth no, uh, until uh, after he got saved. And so I want to ask these guys, why did Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, did he not get the memo? So don't miss this. I, the, the, the point is, the product of giving is not to make you wealthy. Jesus does not encourage his disciples to give of their wealth in order to get more wealth. They give because their nature has been transformed. Listen, God's goal is not to make you wealthy. He may give you wealth. If you're a good manager, a good steward, he may increase, and I think he does. But that's not his goal. His goal is to make you holy. But having said that, let me add that he loves to bring blessing to obedience does he when we're obedient he loves to bring blessing and he's talking a bit about that here in this passage 
The idea here is that when you give to him, he will more than give back and take care of you. You have the promise when you obey God that God will take care of you. And I do believe this. I do believe that God loves to bless his children. I I believe God loves to bless those who love and obey him. Our our grandsons were in town this, um, this past week. And I took them yesterday, I drove them to Birmingham to exchange my daughter and two grandsons and put them in the car of, um, of her husband and their father, and th- they were headed back, and then I, I drove back here. But they were here all week, and they arrived on Monday, late Monday, and I, of course, I didn't get home until early evening on, on Monday, and, and I knew they were there, and I have to tell you, I was excited about seeing them. I love those, y'all know that, I tell you all the time, stories about them, but listen to this, so when I walk in... My oldest, the four-year-old, the little one, uh, is starting to be, I mean, he babbles mostly, but, but he's starting to make sense with some of his words, and the ones that we can't figure out, we just interpret them the way we want them to be. But the older one, of course, now, he, he's a talker. He is a talker big time, and he's smart, and, and you know, he, he can carry on this conversation with, that'll freak you out sometimes, you know. And so uh, I walk in, and he hears me come in the door, and around the corner, coming to the, uh, to the family room, and when I do, he sees me, and he jumps up, and he begins to hop, and he comes flying at me. He throws his arms up, and he says, this is his first words to me. The very first words he says to me is, Pops, I just love you so much. And he jumps up, and I grab hold of him, and we hug and, and swing around there and everything. But I want to tell you something. Those were the first words. Pops, I just love you so much. And it wasn't manipulation. He wasn't saying, there's my pops, I'm going to manipulate him, though he could have at the moment. (laughs) Well, I'll just tell you, when he said that, the floodgates of my heart flew open. Man, when he said that, I just thought, man. And I just thought, whether he knew it or not, what do you want? I want to bless you. I want to bless you. That's how I felt. It's the same way you feel with children. It's the same way uh, you feel with grandchildren. It's just the way you feel. It's unprovoked. I didn't walk in and say, hey, come here. What do you want to tell me? I didn't have to. It was spontaneous, which made it all the more wonderful. Now listen, if I get that, how much more does God get it? When you and I go throw her arms up and go, God, I just love you so much. I love you so much, God. God, thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you for saving me. I just love you so much. I just love you so much. If I get what I get, how much more? And you know what God does? He says, unprovoked, spontaneous love. I love to bless my children. I love to bless my children. God gets it. That's why John 10, 10, Jesus said this, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. I really believe God loves to bless his children, but blessing is not always financial, is it? It's not always financial at all. It's things that we sometimes don't even think about, the blessing of God, but He's promised. I'm, you, look, you don't ever, you think that grandson, you think he has to worry, would Pops take care of me? He said something else to me spontaneously, sitting beside me. We're watching trains. He's into trains. And he looks at me just spontaneously, out of nowhere, has nothing to do with trains. He says, Pops, will you be with me forever? Whew. Man. You know, he, look, he may be smarter than I think. He may say, I figured this pops thing out. (laughs) But the trigger, you get it? Spontaneous. Listen, would I care for him? You better believe it. Now, he's a great, great mom and dad. But listen, I'll be with you as long as I can be with you. If, if I can get that, think how much God gets it when you and I say, God, I just love you. God, will you be with me forever? And Jesus came down in this world to answer that question, yes. 
Let me close. So the product of giving, that's the product of, of giving, is he says, I'll give it back to you. I'll pour out a blessing on you. But second, there's the promise of giving. And what is the promise found here? Well, there are really several promises. But let me just give you one primary promise, I think, and that is at the end of that verse, he says, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, this is a concept of measure that was used in the ancient world. It's very common, really in some senses still common today. It was uh, about fairness. So uh, uh, you get a day's worth of wages for a day's worth of work, right? Fairness kind of thing. It just, it balances out. And so Jesus is saying, look, I, I, can, I can pour out uh, uh, overflowing a pressed down, shaken together. By the way, have you ever put something in a container and you wanted to get more in there and so you kind of patted it down or you banged it down so it would settle so you could put more in then you settle it again, you put more in. The picture here is that's happening. Pressed down, shaken together and you just keep, God just keeps adding it until finally you can't get any more in there and it just kind of overflows. And Jesus says, you, you determine that. He says, so however you measure is the measure that will be used back to you. So if you, if you give scarcely, then God will respond scarcely. If you give moderately, God will respond. That's what he's saying here, the concept of measure. But Jesus says, I want to go beyond, beyond what you're used to. That's why it was so new and so radical Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 9 and 6. He says, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. The promise of giving is that God will give in response back to us. This past May, NPR, that's National Public Radio, they did a, uh, uh, an episode uh, entitled, God, Goodwill Doesn't Want Your Broken Toaster. And the whole episode was about the kind of junk people bring to Goodwill. And they interviewed this, um, this regional supervisor named Heather Steves, and she said this. She said, we hope everyone brings great things that help our programs, but we know some people make some questionable judgments about what is good to donate. And then she holds up a lampshade, and the lampshade is stained. It is disgusting and literally falling apart. And somebody just dropped it off the day before along with a small table, missing a leg, a cracked purple food storage container, and a used sponge. And the, the, the show just highlighted that, that people will just bring a lot of stuff that can't be refurbished, it can't be renewed, it can't be resold. And along with just being gross, these items cost Goodwill money. They don't help Goodwill because what in effect happens, uh, this spokesperson said, is that this all becomes trash and we have to get rid of it. And, and our trash bill adds up to a million dollars a year. And it's been growing every year for the past five years. And she said, and that's just for the 30 stores that I oversee. She said Goodwill threw away last year more than 13 million pounds of waste. Technically, it's other people's trash. And she said, and that's just in the locations of Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Well, I, I read that and I thought, you know, tragically, that sometimes believers are guilty of giving God the stained stuff, the broken stuff, the less over stuff. I don't know if you read my column, but if you, if you haven't, read the, story, the calf story today, all right, I put in there. For you read it today it'll make sense but tragic and it's kind of a comical thing but you'll get it tragically though believers they they're guilty of giving God the second best they're guilty of giving God their leftovers and then they are disappointed when God does not seem to come through for them and so I want to ask you this morning which standard of measure are you using with God. Are you using His or yours? God gave His best in His Son, Jesus Christ, and He expects us to do the very same thing. It's a new year, and it's time for new things and new stewardship. Stewardship is about giving, and you know the greatest gift that was ever given is the gift that God gave us. 
The gift of God's Son. That's the greatest gift ever given. <clears throat> and look, you got to get that before you can get this other. Okay, I, I want to close with a story about my grandson. Hadn't talked about him much. They were here. One of the things he wanted to do, they like to do, is to come up here. Come see me at work. And so, um, I think it was Thursday. They came up here on Thursday. Was that right, Chuck? Thursday? They came up here Thursday. And our oldest grandson, Bodie, the four-year-old, when they can't go to church in Nashville, they watch us. And weather has socked them in several times, like snow, where they couldn't get out and that. And so they watch us. And so he has come to see this as church. So when they watch this, he sees this as church. So he thinks this is what church is. And so he comes up here, and they come down to my office and come in, and he says, Pops, can we go to church? And so I said, of course we can. And so we come walking down here. But now listen, he thought he was going to walk in here and you were all going to be out there. <laughs> and so he comes in, he says, where are the people? I said, well, they only come on Sunday, some of them. <laughs> and so I, I turned the lights on. We came down here. He wanted to come down here. And so I tried to explain that to him. Finally, he got that. And I said, hey, would you like to come up here where Pops is? And uh, he thought he was going to get to come up here with me while I preached. And I will tell you, if he's ever here on a Sunday morning with you, I'm going to bring him up here, okay? Because it'll scare him to death, and he'll go right back down. I know that because I did that with my own daughter when she was his age. And I was exec pastor at a 6,000-member church, and I got up to do the welcome and greeting, and she can't want to come up with me, our daughter Karis, and she looked out at this crowd. We had a 4,000-seat auditorium, so that'll give you some perspective on the size of that thing. And she looked out there, and she put her head in my leg and wrapped her around, and she wouldn't go in. And I said, you want to say anything to these people? She like that. And finally, I had to limp off with her on my leg. But I'm going to bring Bodie up here if he ever gets here. But, so we come, we come down. Nobody, you're, you're not in here. And by the way, they typically will watch the first service, and they'll see the choir up here. And so he comes up here, and um, I said, do you want to you you preach with Pops? And he says, yeah. But first, he walks. The first thing he does, he looks out at the empty seat, and he says, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and my wife, fortunately, was filming all of this. And then he, this is all spontaneous. Then he walks back here. Like he's walking to the choir, but there's nobody there, but he's used to seeing them. And then he looks back and he says, ladies and gentlemen, Pops and I are about to do incredible music. <laughs> and then he says, it will be amazing. It most certainly would if Pops did it. But if anybody could get me to sing, it would be him, you know. So I said, well, well, now we need to preach, don't we? And so we pull, I pull, I get a couple of music stands over there, and I pull one here, and I put one just about his height. He gets a Bible out from behind the, the chair back, and he brings it up there. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. And he says, and I, and I said, what do you think we should read? And he says, I don't know, Pops. I said, how about John 3, 16? And he knows that verse. And so I said, okay, let's open your Bible. I helped him find John 3, 16. He's got it right there. And then I stood here and I said, for God, for God, so love, so love. And we did the verse. He gave his only begotten son. Who's ever believes? And by the way, you'll love this part. When he finished that scripture, he closed the Bible, turned around and said, okay, church is over. <laughs> That's what some of y'all are thinking right now, isn't it? Church, church is over. It stopped raining, pastor. Church is over. Um, but here's why I tell you that. John 3, 16. You know why? Because I thought, if ever there's a verse that I want him to understand, is that there is a great giver named God. And he sent his son into this world to save me and to save that little guy and to save you. And people, I want to tell you something. I want him to know that. That the greatest giver ever was Jesus. And it's not about money. And that our only responsibility with that is to give our soul back to him. You'll never be this if you don't get that.
It'll just be the law instead of the grace. People, if I had 10,000 lives, I could never get back to him what he has given me in his son Jesus. 10,000 lives, I could never get back. I could never get back, but I don't have to. He says, just give me your life. Just give me your life. Just give me your soul. Surrender to me. I'll take care of the rest. That's the great stewardship. And that's where stewardship starts. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? No one's looking about. Have you, have you done that? <clears throat> are you just religious? Those of you who are watching online, you're, <clears throat> you're watching on television, perhaps in this room, have you, have you surrendered yourself? Look, I, if you don't get that right, disregard everything else I've been talking about. But now... You give your soul to Him. That's the first act of giving. You give all. You give yourself. Have you done it? You can right now in this room, on live stream. You can call on Him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, come into my life. I give my soul to You. I give my life to You. I surrender all. Thank You for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I know I need you. And I could never repay you for what you've done. So I offer myself. I need you. I promise you he'll hear that prayer. He's already promised. He will hear that prayer. Maybe, maybe as this new year begins, you say, you know what? I need, I need to be the kind of steward God has created me to be. I know him and I've given my life to him. But I need to obey him and let him... Be to me my source, my provider, my caretaker. Why don't you just tell him this morning, God, I, I want to do it right. I want to do it right for my good, but also because you love me. See if he'll not pour out the floodgates. Maybe right now you tell him, God, I love you. I just love you so much, God. Thank you, God. I just love you. And God, I'll obey you. Because I know you care for me. I know you will take care of me. I know you will be my provider. You already have demonstrated it when you sent Jesus for me. And Father, would you hear us now? As we begin this new year, let us do it right. Let our minds be transformed. Let our hearts be changed. Let our stewardship be realigned, Father, with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me for our invitation before we're gone? I'm going to be here at the front, and our staff will be on the sides. And look, if there's a decision that you need to make, there's a decision you make, why don't you do what people have already done today? Maybe you need to, to you want to join and need to join our family. We'd love to have you in this place. And you want to slip out from the balcony and ground floor, make your way forward and just say, Pastor, we want to become a part of the Ridgecrest family. We'll take it from there. Don't you worry about it. You're on live stream or television. You'll see information and you'll hear information instructions on your screen. Yeah, you can use the tear-off panel, all of that kind of stuff if you, if you wish to. But right now, I want to call you publicly. Maybe you want to come and kneel around this altar, uh, bend that knee, and just thank Him. Maybe it's just a time of thanks for you to thank Him for what He's done and who He's been, what He's given to you. Maybe that's what you want to come and do. Why don't you do that? Maybe you, maybe you called on Him to be your, your Savior. Maybe you want to come and say, Pastor, I did. I prayed that prayer. I called on Him. As Bradley leads us, before we're gone, we'll be gone shortly, but before we're gone, don't miss this moment. Are you ready? Are you ready? You come on right now.